Mm, boo. Hi. All right. This is long overdue, so let's get started. We got the hanky. We got the blankie. We got the book. This is part two, continuation of Essays in Love by Alain de Botton. Nine, beauty. Does beauty give birth to love or does love give birth to beauty? Did I love Chloe because she was beautiful or was she beautiful because I loved her? Surrounded by an infinite number of people, we may ask, staring at our lover while they talk on the phone or lie opposite us in the bath, why your desire has chosen to settle on this particular face, this particular mouth or nose or ear? Why this curve of the neck or dimple in the cheek has come to answer so precisely to our criterion of perfection? Every one of our lovers offers different solutions to the problem of beauty, and yet succeeds in redefining our notions of attractiveness in a way that is as original and as idiosyncratic as the landscape of their face. If Marsilio Ficino 1433-1499 defined love as the desire for beauty, in what ways did Chloe fulfill this desire? To listen to Chloe in no way whatever. No amount of reassurance could persuade her that she was anything but loathsome. She insisted on finding her nose too small, her mouth too wide, her chin uninteresting, her ears too round, her eyes not green enough, her hair not wavy enough, her breasts too small, her feet too large, her hands too wide, and her wrists too narrow. She would gaze longingly at the faces in the pages of Ellen Vogue and declare that the concept of a just God was, in the light of her physical appearance, simply an incoherence. Chloe believed that beauty could be measured according to an objective standard, one she had simply failed to reach. Without acknowledging it as such, she was resolutely attached to a platonic concept of beauty, an aesthetic she shared with the world's fashion magazines and which fueled a daily sense of self-loathing in front of the mirror. According to Plato and the editor of Vogue, there exists such a thing as an ideal form of beauty, made up of a balanced relation between parts, and which earthly bodies will approximate to a greater or a lesser degree. There is a mathematical basis for beauty, Plato suggested, so that the face on the front cover of a magazine is necessarily rather than coincidentally pleasing. Whatever mathematical errors there were in her face, Chloe found the rest of her body even more unbalanced. Whereas I loved to watch soapy water running over her stomach and legs in the shower, whenever she looked at herself in the mirror, she would invariably declare that something was lopsided, though quite what I never discovered. Leon Battista Alberti might have known better, for he believed that any beautiful body had fixed proportions, which he spelt out mathematically after dividing the body of a beautiful Italian girl into 600 units, then working out the distances from section to section. Summing up his results in his book on sculpture, Alberti defined beauty as a harmony of all the parts in whatsoever subject it appears, fitted together with such proportion and connection that nothing could be added, diminished, or altered, but for the worse. But according to Chloe, however, almost anything about her body could have been added, diminished, or altered without spoiling anything that nature had not already devastated. Clearly Plato and Leon Battista Alberti had neglected something in their aesthetic theories, for I found Chloe excessively beautiful. Did I like her green eyes, her dark hair, her full mouth? I hesitate to try and pin down her appeal. Discussions of physical beauty have some of the futility of debates between art historians attempting to justify the relative merits of different artists. A Van Gogh or a Gangwin. One might try to redescribe the work in language, the lyrical intelligence of Gangwin's South Sea skies next to the Wagnerian depth of Van Gogh's blues, or else to elucidate technique or materials, the expressionist feel of Van Gogh's later years, Gangwin's Cezanne-like linearity. But what would all this do to explain why one painting grips us by the collar and another leaves us cold? The language of the eye stubbornly resists translation into the language of words. It was not beauty that I could hope to describe, only my personal response to Chloe's appearance. 
I could simply point out where my desire had happened to settle, while allowing the possibility that others would locate comparable perfection in quite other beings. In so doing, I was forced to reject the platonic idea of an objective criterion of beauty, siding instead with Kant's view, as expressed in his Critique of Judgment, that aesthetic judgments are ones whose determining ground can be none other than subjective. The way I looked at Chloe could have been compared to the famous Mouillet Lyre illusion, where two lines of identical length will appear to be of different sizes according to the nature of the arrows attached at their ends. The loving way that I gazed at Chloe functioned like a pair of outward arrows, which gave an ordinary line a semblance of length it might not objectively deserve. A definition of beauty that more accurately summed up my feelings for Chloe was delivered by Stendhal. Beauty is the promise of happiness, he wrote, pointing to the way that Chloe's face alluded to qualities that I identified with a good life. There was humor in her nose, her freckles spoke of innocence, and her teeth suggested a casual, cheeky disregard for convention. I did not see the gap between her two front teeth as an offensive deviation from an ideal arrangement, but as an indicator of psychological virtue. I took pride in finding Chloe more beautiful than a Platonist would have done. The most interesting faces generally oscillate between charm and crookedness. There is a tyranny about perfection, a certain tedium even, something that asserts itself with all the dogmatism of a scientific formula. The more tempting kind of beauty has only a few angles from which it may be seen, and then not in all lights and at all times. It flirts dangerously with ugliness, it takes risks with itself. It does not side comfortably with mathematical rules of proportion. It draws its appeal from precisely those details that also lend themselves to ugliness. As Proust once said, classically beautiful women should be left to men without imagination. <coughs> My imagination enjoyed playing in the space between Chloe's teeth. Her beauty was fractured enough that it could support creative arrangements. In its ambiguity, her face could have been compared to Wittgenstein's duck rabbit, where both a duck and a rabbit seem contained in the same image. Much depends on the attitude of the viewer. If the imagination is looking for a duck, it will find one. If it is looking for a rabbit, it will appear instead. What counts is the predisposition of the viewer. It was, of course, love that was generously predisposing me. The editor of Vogue might have had difficulty including photos of Chloe in an issue, but this was only a confirmation of the uniqueness that I had managed to find in my girlfriend. I had animated her face with her soul. The danger with the kind of beauty that does not look like a Greek statue is that its precariousness places much emphasis on the viewer. Once the imagination decides to remove itself from the gap in the teeth, it is not time, f is it not time for a good orthodontist? Once we locate beauty in the eye of the beholder, what will happen when the beholder looks elsewhere? But perhaps that was all part of Chloe's appeal. A subjective theory of beauty makes the observer wonderfully indispensable. Speaking love. In the middle of May, Chloe celebrated her 24th birthday. She had for a long time been dropping hints about a red cashmere pullover in the window of a shop in Piccadilly. So the day before the celebration, I bought it on my way back from work and at home wrapped it in blue paper with a pink bow. But in the course of preparing a card, I suddenly realized that I'd never told Chloe that I loved her. A declaration would perhaps not have been unexpected, yet the fact that it had never been made was significant. Pullovers may be a sign of love between a man and a woman, but we had yet to translate our feelings into language. It was as though the core of our relationship, configured around the word love, was somehow unmentionable, either too evident or too significant to be uttered. It was simple to understand why Chloe had never said anything. She was suspicious of words. One can talk problems into existence, she had once said. And just as problems could come from words, so good things could be destroyed by them. I remembered her telling me that when she was 12, her parents had sent her on a camping holiday. 
There she had fallen in love with a boy her age, and after much blushing and hesitation, they had ended up t taking a walk around a lake. By a shaded bank, the boy had asked her to sit down, and after a moment, had taken her damp hand in his. It was the first time a boy had held her hand. She had been so elated. She had felt free to tell him, with all the earnestness of a 12-year-old, that he was the best thing that had ever happened to her. The next day, she discovered that her words had spread all over the camp. A group of girls chanted mockingly, the best thing that ever happened to me when she came into the dining hall, her honest declaration replayed in a mockery of her vulnerability. She had experienced a betrayal at the hands of language, the way intimate words may be converted to a common currency and had since hidden behind a veil of practicality and irony. With her customary resistance to the rose tinted Chloe would therefore probably have shrugged off a declaration with a joke, not because she did not want to hear, but because any formulation would have seemed dangerously close, both to complete cliché and total nakedness. It was not that Chloe was unsentimental. She was just too discreet with her emotions to speak about them in the worn social language of the romantic. Though her feelings may have been directed towards me, in a curious sense, they were not for me to know. My pen was still hesitating over the card. A giraffe was blowing out candles on a heart-shaped cake. Whatever her resistance and my qualms, I felt that the occasion of her birthday called for a linguistic confirmation of the bond between us. I tried to imagine what she would make of the words I might hand her. I pictured her thinking about them on the way to work or in the bath, pleased but reluctant even to savor her own satisfaction. Yet the difficulty of a declaration of love opens up quasi-philosophical concerns about language. If I told Chloe that I had a stomach ache or a garden full of daffodils, I could count on her to understand. Naturally, my image of a bedaffodiled garden might slightly differ from hers, but there would be reasonable parity between the two images. Words would operate as reliable messengers of meaning, but the card I was now trying to write had no such guarantees attached to it. The words were the most ambiguous in the language because the things they referred to so sorely lacked stable meaning. Certainly travelers had returned from the heart and tried to represent what they had seen, but love was, in the end, like a species of rare colored butterfly, often sighted but never conclusively identified. The thought was a lonely one, of the error one may find over a single word, an argument not for linguistic pedants but of desperate importance to lovers who need to make themselves understood. Chloe and I could both speak of being in love, and yet this love might mean significantly different things within each of us. We had often read the same books at night in the same bed and later realized that they had touched us in different places, that they had been different books for each of us. Might the same divergence not occur, occur over a single love line? I felt like a dandelion releasing hundreds of spores into the air and not knowing if any of them would get through. The whole language of love had been corrupted by overuse. When I listened to the radio in the car, my love fed effortlessly off the love songs that happened to be playing. For example, of the passion of a black American female singer whose accent I took on, I was, an empty, I was on an empty motorway, while Chloe became the lady's baby. Wouldn't it be nice to hold you in my arms and love you, baby? To hold you in my arms. Oh yeah, and I say, I do. I say, I love you, baby. How much of what I thought I felt for Chloe had been influenced by songs like these? Was my sense of being in love not just the result of living in a particular cultural epoch? Was it not society rather than any authentic urge that was motivating me to pride myself on romantic love? In previous cultures and ages, would I not have been taught to ignore my feelings for Chloe in the way I was now taught to ignore, more or less, the impulse to wear stockings or to respond to insult with a challenge to a duel? Some people would never have fallen in love if they had never heard of love, aphorized La Rochefoucauld. And does not history prove him right? I was due to take Chloe to a Chinese restaurant in Camden, but declarations of love might have seemed more appropriate elsewhere given the scant regard traditionally given to love in Chinese culture. 
According to the psychological anthropologist L.K. Sue, whereas Western cultures are individual-centered and place great emphasis on emotions, in contrast, Chinese culture is situation-centered and concentrates on groups rather than couples and their love, though the manager of the Lao Tzu was nevertheless delighted to take my booking. Love is never a given. It is constructed and defined by different societies. In at least one society, the Manu of New Guinea, there is not even a word for love. In other cultures, love exists, but is given distinctive forms. Ancient Egyptian love poetry had no interest in the emotions of shame, guilt, or ambivalence. The Greeks thought nothing of homosexuality. Christianity prescribed the body. The troubadours equated love with unrequited passion. The romantics made love into a religion. And the perhaps not very happily married S.M. Greenfield in an article in the Sociological Quarterly, which I had picked up at the dentist, I don't know what it was doing there either, wrote that love is today kept alive by modern capitalism only in order to motivate individuals, where there is no other means of motivating them, to occupy the positions husband, father, and wife, mother, and form nuclear families that are essential not only for reproduction and social socialization, but also to maintain the existing arrangements for distributing and consuming goods and services, and, in general, to keep the social system in proper working order and thus maintain it as a going concern. The sickness, nausea, and longing that I had at times felt at the thought of Chloe might in some societies have been identified as signs of a religious experience. When St. Teresa of Avila, founder of the Discalced Carmelite Order, had a visit from an angel, she described an encounter which it would take a particularly open contemporary mind not to identify with an orgasm. The angel was very beautiful. His face was so aflame that he appeared to be one of the highest types of angels who seemed to be all afire. In his hands I saw a golden spear, and at the end of the iron tip I seemed to see a point of fire. With this he seemed to pierce my heart several times so that it penetrated my entrails. The pain was so sharp that it made me utter several moans, and so excessive was the sweetness caused me by this intense pain that one can never wish to lose it, nor will one's soul be content with anything less than God. In the end, I decided that a card with a giraffe might not be the best place to articulate my feelings, and that I should wait till dinner. At around eight, I drove to Chloe's apartment to pick her up and give her the present. She was delighted to find that I had heard her hints about the Piccadilly window. The only regret, tactfully delivered a few days later, was that it had been the blue and not the red pullover she'd really been pointing to. The receipts gave us a second chance after I had tried to, but been desisted from throwing myself out of the window. The restaurant could not have been more romantic. All around us in the Lao Tzu, couples much like ourselves, though our subjective sense of uniqueness did not allow us to think so, were holding hands, drinking wine, and fumbling with chopsticks. A neighbor's cashew nut came at one point to rest on Chloe's lap. God, I feel better. I must have been starving. I've been so depressed all day, said Chloe. Why? Because I have this thing about birthdays. They always remind me of death and forced jollity. But actually, I think this one's turning out to be not so bad in the end. In fact, it's pretty all right, thanks to a little help from my friend. She looked up at me and smiled. You know where I was this time of year? Last, you know where I was this time last year, she asked. No, where? Being taken out for dinner by my horrible aunt. It was awful. I kept having to go to the bathroom to cry. I was so upset that it was my birthday and the only person who'd invited me out was my aunt with this irritating stutter who couldn't stop telling me she didn't understand how a nice girl like me didn't have a man in her life. So it's probably no bad thing I ran into you. She really was adorable, thought the lover, a most unreliable witness in such matters. But how could I tell her so in a way that would suggest the distinctive nature of my attraction? Words like love or devotion or infatuation were exhausted by the weight of successive love stories, by the layers imposed on them through the uses of others. At the moment when I most wanted language to be original, personal, and completely private, 
I came up against the irrevocably public nature of emotional communication. The restaurant was of no help, for its romantic setting made love too conspicuous, hence insincere. There was a recording of Chopin's nocturnes over the loudspeakers and a heart-shaped candle on the table. We overheard a man at the next table, perhaps a Darwinist, joking it should have been a penis. There seemed to be no way to transport love in the word L-O-V-E without at the same time throwing the most banal associations into the basket. The word was too rich in foreign history. Everything from the Trobadours to Casablanca had cashed in on the letters. Was it not my duty to be the author of my own feelings? Would I not have to fashion a declaration with a uniqueness to match Chloe's? I felt disconcertingly aware of the mundanity of our situation. A man and a woman, lovers, celebrating a birthday in a Chinese restaurant, one night in the Western world, somewhere towards the end of the 20th century. No, my meaning could never make the journey in L-O-V-E. It would have to seek alternative transportation. Then I noticed a small plate of complimentary marshmallows near Chloe's elbow, and it suddenly seemed clear that I didn't love Chloe so much as marshmallow her. What it was about a marshmallow that should suddenly have accorded so perfectly with my feelings towards her, I will never know. But the word seemed to capture the essence of my amorous state with an accuracy that the word love, weary with overuse, simply could not aspire to. Even more inexplicably, when I took Chloe's hand and told her that I had something very important to tell her, that I marshmallowed her, she seemed to understand perfectly, answering it was the sweetest thing anyone had ever told her. From then on, love was, for Chloe and me at least, no longer simply love. It was a sugary, puffy object a few millimeters in diameter that melts deliciously in the mouth. 11. What do you see in her? Summer flew in with the first week of June, making a Mediterranean, Mediterranean city of London, drawing people from their homes and offices into the parks and squares. The heat coincided with the arrival of a new colleague at work, an American architect who had been hired to spend six months working with us on an office complex near Waterloo. They told me it rained every day in London, and look at this, remarked Will, as we sat one lunchtime in a restaurant in Covent Garden. Incredible, and I brought only pullovers. Don't worry, Will, they have t-shirts here too. I had met William not five years before it when we had both spent a year together on a scholarship at Yale. He was immensely tall, with a perpetual tan, intrepid smile, and rugged face of an explorer, but the hands of a pianist. Since finishing his studies at Berkeley, he had developed a successful career on the West Coast, where he was considered one of the most thoughtful practitioners of his generation. The Architect's Journal had described him, with little concern for biological reality, as the illegitimate love child of Mies van der Rohe and Geoffrey Bawa, and even the normally reserved Architectural Review had commended him on his use of concrete. So tell me, are you seeing anyone? asked Will as we began our coffee. You're not still with, what's her name? That, uh, no, no, that finished long ago. I'm involved in something serious now. Great, tell me about it. Well, you must come over for dinner and meet her. I'd love to, tell me more. She's called Chloe, she's 24, she's a graphic designer. She's intelligent, beautiful, very funny. It sounds terrific. How about you? Nothing to say, really. I was dating this girl from UCLA, but you know, we were getting in each other's headspace, so we sort of both pulled the ripcord. We weren't ready to ride the big one together, so... But tell me more about this Chloe. What is it you see in her? What did I see in her? The question came back to me later that evening in the middle of Safeway, watching Chloe at the tilt, enraptured by the way she went about packing the groceries into a plastic bag. The charm I detected in these trivial gestures revealed a readiness to accept almost anything as incontestable proof that she was perfect. What did I see in her? Almost everything. For a moment, I fantasized I might transform myself into a carton of yogurt so as to undergo the same process of being gently and thoughtfully accommodated by her into a shopping bag between a tin of tuna and a bottle of olive oil. 
It was only the incongruously unsentimental atmosphere of the supermarket liver promotion week that alerted me to how far I might have been sliding into romantic pathology. On the way back to the car, I complimented Chloe on the adorable way she had gone about the business of doing the grocery shopping. Don't be so silly, she replied. Can you open the boot? The keys are in my bag. It is easy enough to find charm in a pair of eyes or the contours of a well-shaped mouth. How much harder to detect it in the movements of a woman's hand across a supermarket checkout? Chloe's gestures were like the tips of an iceberg, an indication of what lay submerged. Did it not require a lover to discern their true value, a value that would naturally seem meaningless to someone less curious, less in love? Yet I remained pensive on the drive home through the evening rush hour. My love began to question itself. What did it mean if things I considered charming about Chloe she considered incidental or irrelevant to her true self? Was I reading things into Chloe that simply did not belong to her? I looked at the slope of her shoulders and the way that a strand of her hair was trapped in the car headrest. She turned toward me and smiled, so for an instant I saw the gap in between her two front teeth. How much of my sensitive, soulful lover lay in my fellow passenger? Love reveals its insanity by its refusal to acknowledge the inherent normality of the loved one. Hence the boredom of lovers for those standing on the sidelines. What do they see in the beloved save simply another human being? I had often tried to share my enthusiasm for Chloe with friends, with whom in the past I had found much common ground over films, books, and politics, but who now looked at me with a secular puzzlement of atheist face with messianic fervor. <coughs> After the tenth time of telling frenzy stories of Chloe at the dry cleaner, or Chloe and me at the cinema, or Chloe and me buying a takeaway, these stories with no plot and less action, just a central character standing in the center of an almost motionless tale, I was forced to acknowledge that love was a lonely pursuit. There was, of course, nothing inherently lovable about Chloe's way of packing the groceries. Love was merely something I had decided to ascribe to her gesture, a gesture that might have been interpreted very differently by others in line with us at Safeway. A person is never good or bad per se which means that loving or hating them necessarily has at its basis a subjective and perhaps illusionistic element. I was reminded of the way that Will's question had made the distinction between qualities that belong to a person and those ascribed to them by their lover. He had carefully asked me not who Chloe was, but more accurately, what I saw in her. Shortly after her older brother died, Chloe, who had just celebrated her eighth birthday, went through a deeply philosophical stage. I began to question everything she told me. I had to figure out what death was. That's enough to turn anyone into a philosopher. One of her great obsessions, to which allusions were still made in her family, concerned thoughts familiar to readers, readers of Descartes and Berkeley. Chloe would put her hand over her eyes and tell the family her brother was still alive because she could see him in her mind just as well as she could see them. Why did they tell her he was dead if she could see him in her own mind? Then, in a further challenge to reality and because of the way she felt towards them, Chloe would, with the grin of a six-year-old child facing the power of its hostile impulses, tell her parents she could kill them by shutting her eyes and never thinking of them again a plan which no doubt elicited a profoundly unphilosophical response from the parents. Yet, solipsism has its limits. Were my views of Chloe anywhere near reality, or had I completely lost judgment? Certainly, she seemed lovable to me, but was she actually as lovable as I thought? It was the old Cartesian color problem. A bus may seem red to a viewer but is this bus actually red in and of its, its essence? When Will met Chloe a few weeks later, he certainly had his doubts, unexpressed, of course, but evident from the way he took little interest in her, boring her instead with a lengthy account of how he had once built <coughs> a cantilevered roof for a villa in La Jolla, and in the way he told me at work the next day that for a Californian, English women were, of course, very special. To be honest, Chloe gave me the occasional doubt herself. One night, I remember her sitting in my living room reading while we listened to a Bach cantata I had put on. 
The music sang of heavenly fires, Lord's blessings, and beloved companions, while Chloe's face, tired but happy, bathed by a streak of light crossing the darkened room from the desk lamp, seemed as though it belonged to an angel, an angel who was only elaborately pretending, with trips to Safeway or the post office, that she was an ordinary mortal, but whose mind was in fact filled with delicate and divine thoughts. Because only the body is open to the eye, the hope of the infatuated lover is that the soul is faithful to its casing, that the body owns an appropriate soul, that what the skin represents turns out to be what it is. I did not love Chloe for her body. I loved her body for the promise of who she was. It was a most inspiring promise. Yet what if her face was only a trompe l'oeil? By 40, everyone has the face they deserve, wrote George Orwell. But Chloe was only just 24, and even if she had been older, we are in truth, despite Orwell's optimistic belief in natural justice, <coughs> as unlikely to be given the face we deserve as the money or the opportunities. Can't you turn off this impossible yodeling, said the angel all of a sudden. What impossible yodeling? You know, the music. It's Bach. I know, but it sounds so silly. I can't concentrate on Cosmo. Is it really her I love? I thought to myself as I looked again at Chloe reading on the sofa across the room, or simply an idea that collects itself around her mouth, her eyes, her face. In using her face as a guide to her soul, was I not perhaps guilty of mistaken metonymy, whereby an attribute of an entity is substituted for the entity itself? The crown for the monarchy, the wheel for the car, the White House for the U.S. government, Chloe's angelic expression for Chloe. In the Oasis complex, the thirsty man imagines he sees water, palm trees, and shade, not because he has evidence for the belief, but because he has a need for it. Desperate needs bring about a hallucination of their solution. Thirst hallucinates water. The need for love hallucinates a prince or princess. The oasis complex is never a complete delusion. The man in the desert does see something on the horizon. It is just that the palms have withered, the well is dry, and the place is infected with locusts. Was I not victim of a similar delusion alone in a room with a woman who wore the face of someone composing the divine comedy while working her way through the cosmopolitan astrology column? Twelve, Skepticism and Faith By contrast with the history of love, the history of philosophy shows a relentless concern with the discrepancy between appearance and reality. I think I see a tree outside, the philosopher mutters. But is it not possible that this is just an optical illusion behind my own retina? I think I see my wife, mutters the philosopher, adding hopefully. But is it not possible that she, too, is just an optical illusion? Philosophers tend to limit epistemological doubt to the existence of tables, chairs, the courtyards of Cambridge colleges, and the occasional unwanted wife. But to extend these questions to things that matter to us, to love, for, for instance, is to raise the frightening possibility that the loved one is but an inner fantasy, with little connection to any objective reality. Doubt is easy when it is not a matter of survival. We are as skeptical as we can afford to be, and it is easiest to be skeptical, skeptical about things that do not fundamentally sustain us. It is easy to doubt the existence of a table. It is hell to doubt the legit legitimacy of love. At the start of Western philosophical thinking, the progress from ignorance to knowledge finds itself likened by Plato to a glorious journey from a dark cave into bright sunlight. Men are born unable to perceive reality, Plato tells us, much like cave dwellers who mistake shadows of objects thrown upon the walls for the objects themselves. Only with much effort may illusions be thrown off, and the journey made from the shadowy world into bright sunlight, where things can at last be seen for what they truly are. 
As with all allegories, this is a tale with a moral, that truth is always superior to illusion. It takes another 23 centuries or so until the Socratic assumption about the benefits of pursuing truth is challenged from a practical rather than simply a moral or epistemological standpoint. Everyone from Aristotle to Kant had criticized Plato on the way to reach the truth, but no one had seriously questioned the value of the undertaking. But in his Beyond Good and Evil, 1886, Friedrich, Friedrich Nietzsche finally took the bull by the horns and asked, What in us really wants truth? We ask the value of this. Why not rather untruth and uncertainty, even ignorance? The falseness of a judgment is not necessarily an objection to it. The question is, to what extent is it is life advancing? And our fundamental tendency is to assert that the falsest judgments are the most indispensable to us. That to renounce false judgments would be to renounce life, would be to deny life. From a religious point of view, the value of truth had, of course, been placed into question many centuries before. The philosopher Pascal had talked of a choice facing every Christian in a world unevenly divided between the horror of a universe without God and the blissful but infinitely more remote alternative that God did exist. Even though the odds were in favor of God not existing, Pascal argued that religious faith could still be justified because the joys of the slimmer probability so far outweighed the abomination of the larger one. And so it should perhaps be with love. Lovers cannot remain philosophers for long. They should give way to the religious impulse, which is to believe and have faith, as opposed to the philosophic impulse, which is to doubt and inquire. They should prefer the risk of being wrong and in love to being in doubt and without love. Such thoughts were running through my mind one evening, sitting on Chloe's bed, playing with her toy elephant Guppy. She had told me that when she was a child, Guppy had played an enormous role in her life. He was a character as real as members of her family, and a lot more sympathetic. He had his own routines, his favorite foods, his own way of sleeping and talking, and yet, from a more dispassionate position, it was evident that Guppy was entirely her creation and had no existence outside her imagination. But if there was one thing that would have been ruinous to Chloe's relationship with the elephant, it would have been to ask her whether or not the creature really existed. Does this furry thing actually live independently of you or did you not simply invent him? And it occurred to me then that perhaps a similar discretion should be applied to lovers and their beloveds, that one should never ask a lover does this love-stuffed person actually exist, or are you simply imagining them? Medical history tells us the case of a man living under the peculiar delusion that he was a fried egg. Quite how or when this idea had entered his head, no one knew, but he now refused to sit down anywhere for fear that he would break himself and spill the yolk. His doctors tried sedatives and other drugs to appease his fears, but nothing seemed to work. Finally, one of them made the effort to enter the mind of the deluded patient and suggested that he should carry a piece of toast with him at all times, which he could place on any chair he wished to sit on and thereby protect himself from breaking his yoke. From then on, the deluded man was never seen without a piece of toast handy and was able to continue a more or less normal existence. What is the point of the story? It merely shows that the one may be living under a delusion love, the belief that one is an egg, if one finds the complementary part of it, another lover like Chloe under a similar delusion, a piece of toast, then all may be well. Delusions are not harmful in themselves. They only hurt when one is alone in believing in them, when one cannot create an environment in which they can be sustained. So long as both Chloe and I could preserve the yoke of love intact, what did it matter quite what the truth was? 13. Intimacy. Watching a cube of sugar dissolve into a cup of chamomile tea, Chloe, whose company I relied upon to make my life meaningful, remarked, We can't move in together because of my problem. I have to live on my own or else I melt. It's not that I don't want you, it's that I'm afraid of wanting only you, of finding that there's nothing left of me. 
so excuse it, excuse it as part of my general screwed upness, but I'm afraid I have to stay a bag lady. I had first seen Chloe's bag at Heathrow Airport, a bright pink cylinder with a luminous green shoulder strap. She had arrived at my door with it the first night she came to stay, once more apologizing for its offensive colors, saying she had used it to pack a toothbrush and a set of fresh clothes for the next day. I had assumed the bag would be temporary, but she never gave it up, repacking it every morning as though this might be the last time we would ever see one another, as though to leave even a pair of earrings behind created an unsustainable risk of disillusion. Yet whatever her enthusiasm for independence, with time, Chloe nevertheless began leaving things behind. Not toothbrushes or pairs of shoes, but pieces of herself. It began with language, with Chloe leaving me her way of saying not ever instead of never, and of stressing the be of before or of saying take care before hanging up the telephone. She in turn acquired use of my perfect and if you really think so. Habits began to leak between us. I acquired Chloe's need for total darkness in the bedroom. She followed my way of folding the newspaper. I took to wandering in circles around the sofa to think a problem through. She acquired a taste for lying on the carpet. Diffusion brought with it intimacy. The borders between us ceased to be strictly patrolled. Our bodies no longer felt watched or judged. Chloe could read in bed and slide a finger into her nostrils to clear an obstruction, roll it into a ball till it was dry and hard and swallow it whole without needing to hide or apologize. We could risk intervals of silence. We were no longer paranoid talkers and willing to let the conversation drop lest tranquility seem unfaithful. We grew assured of ourselves in the other's mind, rendering perpetual seduction, stemming from a fear of the opposite, obsolete. I got to know not only Chloe's opinions and habits, but also the finer grain of her being, the sound of her voice when she spoke on the phone in the next room, the rumble of her stomach when she was hungry, her expression before a sneeze, the shape of her eyes when she awoke, the way she shook a wet umbrella and the sound of a brush through her hair. An awareness of each other's peculiarities gave us a need to rename one another. Chloe and I had met with names given to us by our parents and formalized by passports and birth registers and naturally found that the more private knowledge we had acquired of one another deserved to find expression, however oblique, in names that others didn't use. Whereas in her office, Chloe was Chloe. To me, for reasons, for reasons neither of us ever quite understood, she became simply known as Tidge. For my part, because I had once amused her with talk of a word for the pessimistic outlook of German intellectuals, I became known, perhaps less mysteriously, as Welchmers. The importance of these nicknames lay not in the particular name we had landed on. We might have ended up calling one another Pwit and Tick, but in the fact that we had chosen to relabel one another. Tidge suggested a knowledge of Chloe that Roy in accounts did not possess the knowledge of the sound of a brush through her hair. Whereas Chloe belonged to her civil status, Tidge lay beyond the ordinary social realm in the more secret and unique folds of love. In each other's company, we spent a good deal of time discussing how awful other people were. Unable to express ourselves honestly in most of our daily interactions, we could between us aerate our lies and atone for the social niceties we had performed. Chloe became the final repository of my harsh verdicts on friends or colleagues. Things I had long thought about them but had tried to deny, I was free to share with a sympathetic and even encouraging audience. We frequently indulged in orgies of gossip. Whatever the pleasures of discovering mutual lovers, nothing compares with the intimacy of landing on mutual hates. At times, we came close to concluding, though coyness prevented us from quite admitting this openly, that everyone we'd ever come across was deeply flawed, and that we were in truth the only decent humans left on the planet. Love nourished itself through perpetual criticism of outsiders. The finest proof of our loyalty towards one another was our monstrous disloyalties towards everyone else. We retreated into each other's company to laugh at the hypocrisy demanded by society. 
We returned from formal work dinners and mocked the accents and opinions of those to whom we had politely said goodbye minutes before. We might in bed replay a conversation we had just had. I would impersonate a bearded journalist Chloe had spoken to. She would reply as she had done originally, all this while she masturbated me beneath the sheets. I would pretend to be shocked to find Chloe's hand where it was and ask her in the tone of a virginal parson, Madam, what on earth are you doing with my honorable member? Sir, she would reply like an aristocratic lady in a period drama. I have no idea how this dishonorable member ever came to be in my sight. Or she would leap out of bed and scream, Sir, please leave my bed immediately, or I will have to call my manservant Bernard. In our intimacy, social formalities found themselves rerun in a comic light, like a tragedy which is spoofed by the actors backstage. <coughs> the actor playing Hamlet, seizing Gertrude after the performance and shouting through the dressing room, Fuck me, mummy. <laughs> We even started to acquire a story. Love seems indispensably connected to stories. One day, a boy met a girl is enough for an audience to start to want to know what happened next. Powering most love stories are obstacles. Paul and Virginie, Anna and Vronsky, Tarzan and Jane tend to struggle against odds that confirm and enrich their bond. In a jungle, on a shipwrecked boat, or the side of a mountain, the classic romantic couple proves the strength of its love by the vigor with which it overcomes adversities. But there wasn't much adventure or struggle around to be had. The world that Chloe and I lived in had largely been stripped of capacities for epic conflict. Our parents didn't care. The jungle had been tamed. Society hid its disapproval behind universal tolerance. Restaurants stayed open late. Credit cards were accepted almost everywhere and sex was a duty, not a crime. Yet Chloe and I did have a modest story of our own, a set of common experiences that bonded us together. What is an experience? Something that breaks a polite routine and for a brief period allows us to witness things with the heightened sensitivity afforded to us by novelty, danger, or beauty. And it's on the basis of shared experiences that intimacy is given an opportunity to grow. Friendships nourished solely by occasional dinners will never have the depth of those forged on a trek or at a university. Two people who are surprised by a lion in a jungle, clear in will. Unless one of them is eaten, be effectively bonded by what they have seen. Chloe and I were never surprised by a predator, but we lived through a host of small urban experiences. Returning from a party one warm summer's night, we came across a dead body. The corpse lay on the corner of Charlwood Street and Belgrave Road. It was a beautiful young woman who looked at first as though she had collapsed drunk on the pavement. But as we were about to pass her, Chloe noticed the handle of a knife sticking out of her stomach. How much does one know of someone till one has seen a corpse with them? We kneeled down over the body. Chloe took on the voice of a pilot commandeering an agitated or plain hysterical crew, me, during an emergency landing, told me not to look, got me to call the police, checked on the woman's pulse, and carefully left everything as she had found it. I felt in awe of her professionalism, though in the middle of police questioning she broke into uncontrollable sobbing and was unable to banish the image of the knife handle for several weeks. It was a barbaric incident, but one that served to unite us. We spent the rest of the night awake, drinking whiskey in my apartment, telling each other a series of increasingly macabre and silly stories, impersonating policemen and corpses with kitchen knives in order to exercise her fears. A few months later, we were in a bagel shop in Brick Lane, when an elegant man in a pinstripe suit next to us in the queue silently handed Chloe a crumpled note, on which was scrawled in large letters the words, I love you. Chloe opened the piece of paper, swallowed hard on reading it, then looked back at the man who had given it to her. But he had chosen to act as though nothing had happened and simply stared out at the street with the dignified expression of a man in a pinstripe suit. So just as innocently, Chloe folded the note and slipped it into her pocket. The bizarreness of the incident meant that, as with the corpse only more lightheartedly, it became something of a late motif in our relationship an incident in our story to which we constantly alluded. In restaurants, we would occasionally silently slip one another notes with all the mystery of the man in the bagel shop, 
but with only the message, please pass the salt, written on them. For anyone watching, it must have seemed odd and incomprehensible to see us collapsing into giggles. But the essence of leitmotifs is that they refer back to incidents others cannot understand because they were absent from the founding scene. No wonder if such self-referential egotistical behavior drives those standing on the sidelines to distraction. There were plenty of other joint experiences, people we had encountered or things we had seen, done, or heard, which helped to create a common heritage. There was a psychoanalyst we met at a dinner who told Chloe that he was currently sleeping with two of his patients. There was my friend Will Knott who, having initially taken little interest in Chloe, started sending her obscure books on architecture accompanied by quizzical notes. Who can say how long each of us will stand, ran one, appended to steel, the material of the future. There was a toy giraffe we bought in Bath to keep Chloe's elephant company on the bed and ended up calling Jeffrey after a long-necked colleague of Chloe's at work. And there was a meeting with an accountant on a train who confessed she always carried a gun in her handbag. Interest did not naturally belong to such anecdotes. For the most part, only Chloe and I appreciated them. Because of the subsidiary associations we attached to them, Yet these late motifs were important because they give us the feeling that we were far from strangers to one another, that we had lived through things together and remembered the joint meanings we had derived from them. However slight these late motifs were, they acted like cement. The language of intimacy they helped to create was a reminder that, without clearing our way through jungles, slaying dragons, or even sharing apartments, Chloe and I had created something of a world together. I confirmation. Late one Sunday in the middle of July, we were sitting in a cafe at the unkempt end of the Portobello Road. It had been a beautiful day, spent largely in Hyde Park, tanning and reading books. But since around five o'clock, I had been sliding into depression. I felt like going home to hide under the bedclothes. Sunday evening had long saddened me, reminders of death, unfinished business, guilt, and loss. We had been sitting in silence, Chloe reading the papers, I gazing through the window at the traffic and people outside. Suddenly, she leaned over, gave me a kiss and whispered, you're wearing your lost orphan boy look again. No one had ever ascribed such an expression to me before, though when Chloe mentioned it, it at once accorded with and alleviated the confused sadness I happened to be feeling at the time. I felt an intense and perhaps disproportionate love for her on account of that remark because of her awareness of what I had been feeling but had been unable to formulate myself, for her willingness to enter my world and objectify it for me, a gratefulness for reminding the orphan that he is an orphan and hence returning him home. Perhaps it is true that we do not really exist until there is someone there to see us existing. We cannot properly speak until there is someone there who can understand what we are saying. In essence, we are not wholly alive until we are loved. What does it mean that man is a social animal? Only that humans need one another in order to define themselves and achieve self-consciousness in a way that mollusks or earthworms do not. We cannot come to a proper sense of ourselves if there aren't others around to show us what we're like. A man can acquire anything in solitude except a character, wrote Stendhal, suggesting that character has its genesis in the reactions of others to our words and actions. Ourselves are fluid and require the contours provided by our neighbors. To feel whole, we need people in the vicinity who know us well, sometimes better than we know ourselves. Without love, we lose the ability to possess a proper identity. Within love, there is a constant confirmation of ourselves. It is no wonder that the concept of a God who can see us has been central to many religions. To be seen is to be sure that we exist, all the better if one is dealing with a God or partner who loves us. 
Surrounded by people who precisely do not remember who we are, people to whom we often relate our stories and yet who will repeatedly forget how many times we have been married, how many children we have, and whether our name is Brad or Bill, Katrina or Catherine, and we forget much the same about them. Is it not comforting to be able to find refuge from the dangers of invisibility in the arms of someone who has our identity firmly in mind? It is no coincidence if, semantically speaking, love and interest are almost interchangeable. I love butterflies, meaning much the same as I am interested in butterflies. To love someone is to take a deep interest in them, and by such concern to bring them to a richer sense of what they are doing and saying. Through her understanding, Chloe's behavior toward me gradually became studded with elements of what could be termed eye confirmation, contained in her understanding of my many moods, in her knowledge of my tastes, in the things she told me about myself, in her memory of my routines and habits and in her humorous acknowledgement of my phobias, lay a multitude of varied eye confirmations. Chloe noticed that I was a hypochondriac, that I was shy and hated speaking on the phone, was obsessive in my need to get eight hours sleep at night, hated lingering in restaurants at the end of meals, used politeness as an aggressive defense, and preferred to say maybe rather than yes or no. She would quote me back at myself. Last time, you said you didn't like that kind of irony patiently holding in mind elements, both good and bad, of my character. You always panic whenever. I've never seen anyone forget patrol as often you do. I was afforded a chance to mature thanks to the insights into my personality that Chloe afforded me. It takes the intimacy of a lover to point out facets of character that others simply don't bother with. There were times when Chloe would tell me frankly that I was defensive or critical or more colorfully a jumped up twerp or as nasty as congealed gravy. And I would be brought face to face with areas of myself that ordinary introspection in the interests of inner harmony would have avoided, that others would have been too uninterested to highlight and that it needed the honesty of the bedroom to reveal. Happiness with other people seems bounded by two kinds of excess, suffocation and loneliness. Chloe had always felt the former to be the greater danger. Oppressed by the judgmental and controlling attitudes of her parents, at school she had dreamt of spending time wholly on her own, and in her year off before university, flew to Arizona on the proceeds of money she had saved up from years of holiday and Saturday jobs. She rented a cabin on the edge of a tiny town she had picked almost at random on a map. She acquired a shelf full of books that she'd always longed to read and which she intended to work her way through as she watched the sunrise and set over the moonscape. But within a few weeks of arriving, she began to feel the solitude that she had longed for all her life start to work a disorienting and frightening effect on her. The sound of her own voice came as a shock when she heard it in the shops. Her books felt remote and unengaging. She took to staring at herself in the mirror to retain a sense of being. She felt paranoid and ethereal. After only a month, she abruptly decided to leave her cabin for a job as a waitress in a restaurant in Phoenix, unable to bear any longer the feeling of unreality that had descended on her. When she reached Phoenix, social contact was like water to a parched survivor. She launched into conversations whenever she could, delighting in the comfort offered by the simplest exchanges. It was a long time before I was in any position to help Chloe to feel understood. Only slowly did I begin to unearth, from among the millions of words she spoke and actions she performed, the great themes of her life. In our knowledge of others, we are necessarily forced to interpret clues. We are like detectives or archaeologists who piece together stories from fragments, tracing the origins of a murder from a kitchen towel and a lemon squeezer, or a civilization from a gardening implement and an earring. I often got it wrong. For example, it was a while before I quite appreciated the role of self-denial in her life. One morning in my flat, as we were having breakfast, she told me she had been ill in the night, had crept out of bed, and driven to a chemist all without waking me up. My first reaction was bewildered anger, 
Why had she not said something? Was our relationship really so distant that she couldn't wake me up even in a crisis? But my anger, only a form of jealousy, was crude. It failed to take into account what I only gradually learned. How deep-seated and pervasive was Chloe's inclination to suffer in silence. She would have to have been near death before waking me, for everything about her wished not to place responsibility on others. Once I had located this strand in her nature, other aspects could be understood as related manifestations of it. Her lack of knowledge, her lack of acknowledged anger towards her parents, an anger that allowed itself expression only in savage irony, her self-deprecation, her harshness, her harshness towards self-pitying people, her sense of duty, even her way of crying, muted sobs rather than hysterical wailings. Like a telephone engineer sitting on the edge of a manhole with a jumble of cables in his lap, I slowly learned to identify some key threads in Chloe's personality. I began to recognize her hatred of stinginess every time we were in a group restaurant. We were in a group in a restaurant. I began sensing her desire not to be trapped, the desert escapist side of her nature. I admired her constant visual creativity, which showed itself not just in her work, but in the way she would lay the table or arrange a bowl of flowers. I began detecting her awkwardness with other women and her greater ease with men. I recognized her fierce loyalty to those she considered her friends, an instinctive sense of clan and community. With such, with such characteristics, Chloe slowly assumed a complex coherence in my mind, someone with consistency and a degree of predictability, someone whose tastes in a film or a person I could now begin to guess without asking. The problem with needing others to, legitim to legitimate our existence is that we are very much at their mercy to have a correct identity ascribed to us. If, as Stendhal says, we lack a character without others, then the other with whom we share our bed must be a skilled intermediary or we will end up feeling deformed and misrepresented. But do not others by definition always distort us, whether for better or worse? Everyone returns us to a different sense of ourselves, for we become a little of who they think we are. Ourselves could be compared to an amoeba, whose outer walls are elastic and therefore adapt to the environment. It is not that the amoeba has no dimensions, simply that it has no self-defined shape. It is my absurd aside that an absurdist person will draw out of me, and my seriousness that a serious person will evoke. If someone thinks I am shy, I will probably end up shy. If someone thinks me unfunny, I am likely to keep cracking jokes. When Chloe had lunch with my parents, she was silent throughout the meal. I later asked her what was wrong, but she herself couldn't understand. She had tried to be lively, and yet the suspicions of the two strangers facing her across the table had stopped her from expanding into her usual self. My parents had not been overtly nasty, yet their stiffness had prevented Chloe from rising above monosyllab monosyllabicity. <coughs> it was a reminder that the labeling of others is usually a silent process. Most people do not openly force us into roles. They merely suggest that we adopt them through their reactions to us, and hence surreptitiously prevent us from moving beyond whatever mold they have assigned us. A few years before, Chloe had for a time gone out with an academic at London University. The analytical philosopher, who had written five books and contributed to many scholarly journals, had left her with a sense of total mental inadequacy. How had he done this? Chloe couldn't tell. Without ever expressly saying anything critical, he had succeeded in shaping the amoeba according to his preconceptions, namely that Chloe was a beautiful young student who should leave matters of the mind to him. And so, like a self-fulfilling prophecy, Chloe had begun unconsciously acting on the verdict of her character, handed out like a covert end-of-term report by the wise philosopher who had written five books and contributed to many scholarly journals. She had ended up feeling exactly as stupid as she was believed to be. Children are always described from a third-person perspective. 
Isn't Chloe a cute, ugly, intelligent, stupid kid? Before they gain the ability to influence their own definitions. Overcoming childhood could be understood as an attempt to correct the false stories of others, but the struggle against distortion continues beyond childhood. Most people get us wrong, either out of neglect or prejudice. Even being loved implies a gross bias, a pleasant distortion, but a distortion nevertheless. Like narcissists, we are doomed to disappointment in gazing at our reflection in the watery eyes of another. No eye can wholly contain our eye. We will always be chopped off in some area or other, fatally or not. When I told Chloe my idea that people's personalities and relationships were a bit like amoebas, she laughed and told me she'd love a drawing. She, she laughed and told me she'd loved drawing amoebas at school. Here, give me the newspaper, she said, reaching in her bag for a pencil. I'll draw you the difference between what shape my amoeba self has at the office and what shape it has with you. What are all the wiggly bits? I asked. Oh, that's because I feel wiggly around you. What? Well, you know, you give me space. I feel more complicated than in the office. You're interested in me and you understand me better, so that's why I made it wiggly, so that it's sort of natural. Okay, I see. So what's the straight side? Where? Up, n up in the northwest of the amoeba. You know, I never did much geography, but yeah, I think I see it. Well, you don't understand everything about me, do you? So I thought I'd better make it more realistic. The straight line is all the sides of me you don't understand or don't have time for and stuff. Oh. Christ, don't make that long face. You wouldn't want to know what could happen if that line went squiggly. And don't worry, if it was that serious, I wouldn't be squidged here with you being such a happy amoeba. What did Chloe mean by her amoebic straight line? Just that I could not wholly understand her. An unsurprising but still sobering reminder of the limits of empathy. What was frustrating my efforts? Perhaps that I was constrained to fathoming her through my existing conceptions of human nature. My knowledge of her was necessarily filtered through my own past. Like a European who orients himself in a Rocky Mountain landscape by saying, this looks just like Switzerland. I might only have grasped the source of one of Chloe's depressed moods by thinking, it's because she's feeling X, like my sister Wen. To comprehend her, I had to rely on an understanding of human nature that had been shaped by my biology class and psychological biography. To illustrate how we can only ever pick up on certain elements in our beloved's characters, we might compare the way we look at them to a barbecue skewer. For instance, I was able to skewer or appreciate or relate to Chloe's irony, color of eyes, gap between two front teeth, intellect, talent for baking bread, relationship with her mother, social anxiety, love of Beethoven, hatred of laziness, taste for chamomile tea, Objection to snobbery, love of woolen clothes, clothes, claustrophobia, desire for honesty. Yet this was far from compromising everything about her. Had I been a different barbecue skewer, I might have had more time for her. Interest in healthy eating, ankles, love of outdoor markets, mathematical talent, relationship with her brother, love of nightclubs, thoughts on God, enthusiasm for rice, day gas, skating, long country walks, objection to music in the car, taste for Victorian architecture. Though I felt myself attentive, attentive to the complexities of Chloe's nature, I must have been guilty of great abbreviations, of passing lightly over areas I simply did not have the empathy or maturity to understand. I was responsible for the greatest but most unavoidable abbreviation of all, that of only being able to participate in Chloe's life as an outsider, someone whose inner world I could imagine but never directly experience. However close we might be, Chloe was, in the end, another human being. With all the mystery and distance this implied, the inevitable distance embodied in the thought that we must die alone. We long for a love in which we are never reduced or misunderstood. We have a morbid resistance to classification by others, to others placing labels on us, 
the man, the woman, the rich one, the poor one, the Jew, the Catholic, etc. To ourselves, we are, after all, always unlabelable. When alone, we are always simply me and shift between sides of ourselves effortlessly and without the constraints imposed by the preconceptions of others. But hearing Chloe one day talk of this guy I was seeing a while back, I was saddened to imagine myself in a few years' time, another man facing her across the tuna salad, being described merely as this architect guy that I was once seeing. Her casual reference to a past lover provided the necessary objectification for me to realize that, however special I was to her, I still existed within certain definitions, a guy, my boyfriend, and that in Chloe's eyes, I was necessary, necessarily a simplified version of myself. But as we must be labeled, characterized, and defined by others, the person we end up loving is the good enough barbecue skewer, the person who loves us for more or less the things we deem ourselves to be lovable for, who understands us for more or less the things we need to be understood for. That Chloeba and I were together in that Chloeba and I were together implied that, for the moment at least, we have been given enough room to expand in the ways our complexities demanded. Fifteen, intermittences of the heart. The stories we tell are always too simple. I was a man in love with a woman, but how much of the mobility and inconstancy of my emotions could such a sentence hope to carry? Was there room in it for all the infidelity, boredom, irritation, and indifference that was often knitted together with this love? Could any simple account accurately reflect the degree of ambivalence to which all relationships seem fated? Chloe and I lived a love story stretching over an expanse of time during which our feelings gyrated so much that to talk of being simply in love was, though reassuring, a desperately crude foreshortening of events. One weekend, we went to Bath. At work the day after, when someone asked what I'd been up to, I replied, we had a great couple of days in Bath. Even in my own mind, the story of what had occurred grew elementary and facile. I remembered a beautiful sandy colored town and a blue sky. I remembered being happy. I remembered Chloe saying that I was a better, different sort of person on holiday. And yet, if I now force myself to think back, to tell more than a one-line story, then I start to recall a more complicated set of events. Pollulating beneath the surface of the trip, events which it might take 400 pages to describe properly. To make a stab, I remember that shortly after our arrival, Chloe and I had an argument about what room we'd take in the hotel. I suggested we make a fuss about the one we were initially offered because I didn't like the curtains and there was a strange dripping sound in the bathroom. Chloe called me no longer endearingly insane. On a walk around the Abbey, I became preoccupied with my professional life and wished that I'd chosen a different career that paid more. When Chloe asked me what was wrong, I told her I was jealous of Will for all the attention he was getting among our peers. In the evening, Chloe declined to have sex, saying it was her period, though I suspected this had ended a bit earlier. The next day in a restaurant called John Wood the Elder, I was drawn to a beautiful girl with glasses sitting near us and irrationally engineered an argument with Chloe about wildlife reserves to punish her for her inadvertent role in preventing me from kissing the stranger who didn't seem sad about what she was missing out on. While on the way to the station, Chloe mysteriously flirted with a cross-eyed taxi driver, telling him that she loved showing off her belly button in summer, which resulted in a sulk on my part that didn't end until we reached Paddington Station three hours later. Perhaps we can forgive ourselves for telling simple stories which sum up weekends with the word pleasant, Stories which thereby introduce order into events which are in fact made up of tissues of troubling and ambivalent feelings. Yet perhaps we also owe it to ourselves occasionally to face the flux between to face the flux beneath the abbreviations. I loved Chloe, and yet how much more very 
variegated the reality was. When her friend Alice invited us to dinner one Friday night, Chloe accepted and predicted that I would fall in love with her. There were eight of us around Alice's dining table, everyone jogging elbows as they tried to bring the food to their mouths over a table built for four. Alice lived alone in the top floor of a house in Belham, worked as a secretary at the Arts Council, and I had to admit, I did fall a little in love with her. However happy we may be with our partner, our love for them necessarily hinders us from pursuing alternatives. Why should this constrain us if we love them? Why should we feel this as a loss unless our love for them has already begun to wane? Because in resolving our need to love, we do not always succeed in re resolving our need to long. Watching Ellis talk, light a candle that had blown out, rush into the kitchen with the plates and brush a strand of blonde hair from her face, I found myself falling victim to romantic nostalgia, which descends whenever we are faced with those who might have been our lovers, but whom chance has decreed we will never probably know. The possibility of an alternative love story is a reminder that the life we are leading is only one of a myriad of possible lives, and it is the impossibility of leading them all that plunges us into sadness. There is a longing for a return to a time without the need for choices, free of the regret at the inevitable loss that all choice, however wonderful, has entailed. In city streets, I would often be made aware of hundreds, and by implication even millions, of women whose lives were running concurrently with mine, but who were fated to remain a mystery to me. Though I loved Chloe, the sight of these women occasionally filled me with such regret, it seemed like the only solution might be to tell them how I felt, and thus alleviate the burden of sadness. I resisted the impulse. Standing on a train platform or in the line at the bank, I would catch sight of a given face, perhaps overhear a snatch of conversation. The woman's car had broken down. She was graduating from university. Her mother was ill and feel torn apart by being unable to know the rest of the story and kiss its protagonist. <clears throat> I could have chatted to Alice on the sofa after dinner, but something made me reluctant to do anything but dream. Alice's face evoked a void inside of me with no clear dimensions or intentions and that my love for Chloe had somehow not resolved. The unknown carries with it a mirror of all our deepest, most inexpressible wishes. The unknown is the fatal proposition that a face seen across the room will always hold out to the known. I may have loved Chloe, but because I knew Chloe, I did not long for her. Longing cannot indefinitely direct itself at those we know, for their qualities are charted and therefore lack the mystery longing demands. A face seen for a few moments or hours, only then to disappear forever, is the necessary catalyst for dreams that cannot be formulated. A desire that seems as indefinable as it is unquenchable. <clears throat> so, did you fall in love with her? Chloe asked in the car. Of course not. She's your type. No, she isn't. And anyway, you know I'm in love with you. In the typical scenario of betrayal, one partner asks the other, how could you have betrayed me with X when you said you loved me? But there is no inconsistency between a betrayal and a declaration of love if time is taken into the equation. I love you can only ever be taken to mean for now. I was not lying to Chloe, but my words were time-bound promises, a truth too disturbing for most relationships fully to take on board or else couples would have little to talk about other than their fluctuating feelings. I was not only imaginatively unfaithful, I was also often bored. As inhabitants of luxury hotels and palaces attest, one can get used to anything. For periods, I entirely ceased to notice the miracle that was Chloe's love for me. She became a normal and hence invisible feature of my life. Then would come moments when I'd recover the ability to see her as I had done in the early days of our love story. <clears throat> One weekend, on a visit to Winchester, we broke down on the motorway and called the AA for help. When a van arrived a quarter of an hour later, Chloe went to deal with the mechanic. A primitive impulse had left me unable to talk to him, from a feeling of embarrassment that, 
though I was a man, I hadn't been able to repair the car, let alone work out how the bonnet opened. Watching her talk to this stranger, he was in leather from tip to toe, for reasons I hoped were strict, strictly related to his professional role. By a form of identification with him, the woman I knew abruptly appeared foreign to me. I looked at her face and heard her voice without the dulling blanket of familiarity. I saw her as she might strike a leather-clad mechanic. I saw, her, I saw her stripped of the normalizing influence of time. As a result, I was overcome by an urge to tear off her gray-green cardigan and make passionate love to her on the motorway embankment. The disruption of habit had made Chloe unknown and exotic again, desirable like a woman. I'd never touched, even though she had only that morning walked around my flat naked without arousing any wish in me beyond that of finishing an article I had begun reading on macroeconomics in the developing world. It took the AA man a few minutes to locate the fault, something to do with the battery. You want me to watch your levels, darling? He had called out to Chloe from behind the bonnet and we were ready to continue to Winchester. But my desire signaled otherwise. Imagine that you've broken down by the side of the road and I'm this leather clad stranger who wants to take off your clothes and take you roughly on the embankment, lifting up your innocent flowery skirt and handling you without mercy. Are you sure? With all my loins. Christ, okay, well give me a moment to perfect my stranded without a battery but extremely horny expression. <clears throat> we made love twice on the back seat of Chloe's Volkswagen, in between pieces of luggage and old papers. Though welcome, our sudden and unpredictable ecstasy, the grasping at one another's clothes, and the imaginative scenarios, I adopted a Scottish accent for the roadside tryst, she played at being married, but looking, were reminders of how confusing the flux of passions could be. Capable of being seized off the motorway by desire, might we not drift apart on the back of less compatible thoughts and hormones at a later date? Chloe and I had a joke between us, which acknowledged the intermittences of the heart and eased the demand that love's light burn with the constancy of an electric bulb. Is something wrong? Do you not like me today? One of us would ask. I like you less. Really? Much less? No, not that much. Out of ten? Today, oh, probably six and a half, or no, perhaps more six and three quarters. And how about you, and how about with you, with me? God, I'd say around minus three, though it might have been around twelve and a half earlier this morning when you. In another Chinese restaurant, Chloe loved them. I realized that life with other people functioned a little like the wheel at the center of the table on which dishes had been placed and which could be revolved so that one would be faced by shrimp one minute, pork the next. Did loving someone not follow a similar circular pattern in which there were regular revolutions in the intensity and nature of one's feelings? We tend to remain attached to a fixed view of emotions, as though a line existed between loving and not loving that could only be crossed twice at the beginning and end of a relationship, rather than commuted across from minute to minute. But in reality, in only a day, I might go around every available emotional dish on my inner Chinese platter. I, mean, I might feel that Chloe was funny, but judgmental and intelligent, yet talented, but proud, but too nervous, yet generous, unsentimental, but beautiful. I was not alone in my erratic moods, for there were times when Chloe too would unexpectedly display bursts of aggression or frustration. Discussing a film with friends one night, she swerved into a hostile speech about my consistently patronizing attitudes towards other people. I was at first baffled, for I had not even said anything, but I soon guessed that I was being repaid for a previous offense, or even that I had become a useful target for a disgruntlement that Chloe was feeling towards someone else. Many of our arguments had an unfairness to them. I might get furious with Chloe not for the surface reason that she was emptying the dishwasher very noisily when I was trying to watch the news, but because I was feeling guilty about not having answered a difficult business call earlier in the day. 
Chloe might in turn deliberately make lots of noise in an effort to symbolize an anger she had not communicated to me that morning. We might define maturity as the ability to give everyone what they deserve when they deserve it, to separate, to separate the emotions that belong and should be restricted to oneself from those that should at once be expressed to their initiators, rather than passed on to later and more innocent arrivals. We were often not mature. If philosophers have traditionally advocated a life lived according to reason, condemning in its name a life led by desire, it is because reason is a bedrock of continuity. Unlike romantics, philosophers do not let their interests veer insanely from Chloe to Alice and back to Chloe again, because stable reasons support the choices they have made. In love, they will stay constant, their feelings as assured as the trajectory of an arrow in a flight. As a result of such reasoning, philosophers can be assured a stable identity for who I am is to a large extent constituted by what I want. If the emotional man one day loves Samantha and the next Sally, then who is he? If I went to bed one night loving Chloe and awoke the next morning indifferent to her, then who was I? Yet I was also faced with the intractable problem of locating solid reasons for either loving or not loving Chloe. Objectively, there were no compelling reasons to do either, which made my occasional ambivalence toward her all the more irresolvable. Had there been sound, unassailable reasons to love or hate, there would have been benchmarks to return to. But just as the gap between two front teeth had never been a reason to fall head over heels in love with someone, so opinions on wildlife reserves was never a fair basis for hating them. Tempering our ambivalence was a contrary pull towards stability and continuity, which reined us in whenever there was an urge to develop romantic subplots or digress from our love story. Waking up from an erotic dream I had spent in the company of a woman who was a blend of two faces I had seen at a conference on solar energy the day before, I once relocated myself emotionally on finding Chloe beside me. I stereotyped my possibilities. I returned to the role assigned to me by my status as a boyfriend. I bowed to the tremendous authority of what already exists. <clears throat> Tempests within the couple were also kept in check by the more stable assumptions that others around us held about our relationship. I remember a furious row that erupted a few minutes before we were due to meet friends for coffee on Saturday. At the time, we both felt this row to be so serious. We imagined breaking up over it. Yet this possibility was curtailed by the arrival of friends who could not remotely envis envisage such a thing. Over coffee, there were questions directed at the couple, which betrayed no knowledge of the possibility of rupture and hence helped to avoid it. The presence of others moderated our mood swings. When we were unsure of where we were going, we could hide beneath the comforting analysis of those who stood on the outside, aware only of the continuities, unaware that there was nothing inviolable about our plot line. We also found comfort in planning the future because there was a threat that love might end as suddenly as it had begun. We tried to reinforce the present through an appeal to a common destiny. We dreamt of where we would live and how many children we would have. We identified ourselves with the wrinkled couples taking their grandchildren for walks and holding hands in Kensington Gardens. Defending ourselves against love's demise, we took pleasure in planning a mutual future in precise detail. There were houses we both liked near Kentish Town and together decorated in our heads, completing them with two small studies at the top, a large fitted kitchen with the sleekest appliances in the basement, and a garden full of flowers and trees. Though we had not discussed marriage in any concrete way, we had to believe that there was no reason why we might not contractually bind our hearts together. How is it possible to love someone and at the same time imagine decorating a house with someone else? It was indispensable that we contemplate what it would be like to grow old together and retire with our dentures to a bungalow by the sea. My dislike of talking about ex-lovers with Chloe stemmed from a related fear of inconstancy. Ex-lovers were reminders that situations I had at one point thought to be permanent 
have proved not to be so. From within a relationship, there is an infinite cruelty in the, in the idea of one's indifference towards past loves. One evening in the bookshop of the Hayward Gallery, I caught sight of an old girlfriend leafing through a biography of Giacometti across the room. Chloe was a few steps away from me, searching for some postcards to send to friends. Gio Cometti had meant much to this ex-girlfriend and me. I could easily have gone to say hello. After all, I had met several of Chloe's former lovers, one or two of whom, saw, of whom she saw on a regular basis. But my discomfort was too deep. The woman evoked a fickleness in myself, and by extension, and just as importantly in Chloe, that I lacked the courage to face. There is something appalling in the idea that a person for whom you would sacrifice anything today might in a few months collect it across a road or a bookshop. If my love for Chloe constituted the essence of myself at that moment, the, then the definitive end of my love for her would mean nothing less than the death of a part of me. If Chloe and I continued despite all this to believe we were in love, it was perhaps because the affection far outweighed the boredom and indifference. Yet we always remained aware that what we had chosen to call love might be an abbreviation for a far more complex and ultimately less palatable reality. The fear of happiness. One of love's greatest drawbacks is that for a while at least, it is in danger of making us seriously happy. Chloe and I chose to travel to Spain in the final week of August. Travel, like love, an attempt to follow a dream into reality. In London, we had read the brochures of Utopia Travel, specialists in the Spanish rental market, and had settled for a converted farmhouse in the village of Arras de El Puente, in the mountains behind Valencia. The house looked better in reality than it had in the photographs. The rooms were simple, simply but comfortably furnished. The bathroom worked, and there was a terrace shaded by vine leaves. A lake nearby to swim in, and a farmer next door who kept a goat and welcomed us with a soft gift of olive oil and cheese. We had arrived in the late afternoon, having hired a car at the airport and driven up the narrow mountain roads. We immediately went for a swim, diving into the clear blue waters and drying off in the dying sun. Then we had returned to the house and sat on the terrace with a bottle of wine and olives to watch the sunset behind the hills. Isn't it wonderful? I remarked lyrically. Isn't it? Echoed Chloe. What is it? I joked. Shush, you're ruining the scene. No, I'm serious. It really is wonderful. I could never have imagined a place like this existing. It seems so cut off from everything, like a paradise no one's bothered to ruin. I could spend the rest of my life here, <coughs> sighed Chloe. So could I. We could live here together. I'd tend the goats, you'd handle the olives, we'd write books, paint, and f are you all right? <coughs> I asked, seeing Chloe suddenly wince with pain. Yeah, I am now. I don't know what happened. I just got this terrible pain in my head, like an awful throbbing or something. It's probably nothing. Ah, uh, no, shit. There it comes again. Let me feel. You won't be able to feel anything. It's inside. I know, but I'll empathize. God, I'd better lie down. It's probably just the traveling or the height or something. But I'd better go inside. You stay out here. I'll be fine. Chloe's pains did not get better. She took an aspirin and went to bed, but she was unable to sleep. Unsure of how seriously to take her suffering, but worried that her natural tendency to play everything down meant it was probably extremely serious, I decided to get a doctor. The farmer and his wife were in their cottage eating dinner when I knocked and asked in fragments of Spanish where the nearest doctor could be found. It turned out he lived in Valer de... Villar del Aros Bispo, a village some 20 kilometers away. Dr. Saavedra was immensely dignified for a country doctor. He wore a white linen suit, had spent a term at Imperial College in the 1950s, was a lover of the English theatrical tradition, and seemed delighted to accompany me back to assist the maiden who had fallen ill so early in her Spanish sojourn. 
When we arrived back in Arasta El Puente, Chloe's condition was no better. I left the doctor alone with her and waited nervously in the next room. Ten minutes later, the doctor emerged. It's nothing to worry about. She'll be okay? Yes, my friend. She'll be okay in the morning. What was wrong with her? Nothing much. A little stomach, a little head. It's very common among the Olive makers. I give her pills. Really just a little anecdonia in the head. What you expect? Dr. Saavedra had diagnosed a case of anhedonia, a disease defined by the British Medical Association as a reaction remarkably close to mountain sickness, resulting from the sudden terror brought on by the threat of happiness. It was a common disease among tourists in this region of Spain, faced in these idyllic surroundings with the sudden realization that earthly happiness might be within their grasp, and pray, therefore, to a violent psychological physiological reaction designed to counteract such a daunting possibility. Because happiness is so terrifying and anxiety-inducing to accept somewhat unconsciously, Chloe and I had always tended to locate hedonia either in a memory <clears throat> or in anticipation. Though the pursuit of happiness was our avowed goal, it was accompanied by an implicit belief that it would be realized somewhere in the very distant future. A belief challenged by the felicity we had found in Arasta El Puente, and to a lesser extent, in each other's arms. Why did we live this way? Perhaps because to enjoy ourselves in the present would have meant engaging ourselves in an imperfect or dangerously ephemeral reality, rather than hiding behind a comfortable belief in an, a comfortable belief in an afterlife. Living in the future perfect tense, always holding up an ideal life to contrast with the present, one that would save us from the need to commit ourselves to our situation. It was a pattern akin to that found in certain religions, in which life on earth is only a prelude to an everlasting and far more pleasant heavenly existence. Our attitude towards holidays, parties, work, and perhaps love had something immortal to it, as though we would be on earth for long enough not to have to stoop so low as to think these occasions finite in number, and hence be forced to draw proper value from them. If Chloe had now fallen ill, was it not perhaps because the present was catching up with her dissatisfaction? The present had, for a brief moment, ceased to lack anything the future might hold. But was I not just as guilty of the disease as Chloe? Had there not been many times when the pleasures of the present had been rudely passed over in the name of the future, love stories in which, almost imperceptibly, I had abstained from loving fully, comforting myself with the immortal thought that there would be other love affairs I would one day try to enjoy with the insouciance of men in magazines, future loves that would re redeem my calamitous efforts to communicate with another whom history had set spinning on the earth at much the same time as me? The future has some of the satisfactions and safety of the past. I recalled that as a child, every holiday grew perfect only when I was home again, for then the anxiety of the present would make way for stable memories. I spent whole childhood years looking forward to the winter holidays when the family took two weeks to go skiing in the Alps. But when I was finally on top of a slope, looking at pine-covered valleys below me and a fragile blue sky above, I felt a pervasive existential anxiety that would then evaporate from the memory of the event, a memory that would be exclusively composed of the objective conditions, the top of a mountain, a fragile blue sky, and would hence be free of everything that had made the actual moment trying. The present was unpleasant not because I might have had a runny nose or been thirsty or forgotten a scarf but because of my reluctance to accept that I was finally going to live out a possibility that had all year resided in the comforting folds of the future. Yet as soon as I had reached the bottom of the slope, I would look back up the mountain and declare that it had been a perfect run. And so the skiing holiday and much of my life generally proceeded. Anticipation in the morning, anxiety in the actuality, and pleasant memories in the evening. There was for a long time something of this paradox in my relationship with Chloe. I would spend all day looking forward to a meal with her, 
would come away from it with the best impressions, but find myself faced with a present that, it's, that had never equaled its anticipation or memory. It was one evening shortly before we'd left for Spain on Will Knott's houseboat with Chloe and other friends when, because everything was so perfect, I first grew unavoidably unaware of my lingering suspicions towards the present moment. Most of the time, the present is too flawed to remind us that the disease of living in the present imperfect tense is within us and nothing to do with the world outside. But that evening in Chelsea, there was simply nothing I could fault the moment on and hence had to realize that the problem lay within me. The food was delicious, friends were there, Chloe was looking beautiful, sitting next to me and holding my hand. And yet something was wrong all the same. The fact that I could not wait till the event had slipped into history. The inability to live in the present lies in the fear of leaving the sheltered position of anticipation or memory. And so of admitting that this is the only life that one is ever likely, heavenly intervention aside, to live. If commitment is seen as a group of eggs, then to commit oneself to the present is to risk putting all one's eggs in the present basket, rather than distributing them between the baskets of past and future. And to shift the analogy to love, to finally accept that I was happy with Chloe, would have meant accepting that, despite the danger, all of my eggs were firmly in her basket. Whatever pills the good doctor had given her, Chloe seemed completely cured the next morning. We prepared a picnic and went back to the lake, where we passed the day swimming and reading by the water. We spent 10 days in Spain, and I believe, as much as one can trust memory, that for the first time, we both risked living those days in the present. Living in this tense did not always mean bliss. The anxieties created by love's unstable happiness routinely exploded into argument. I remember a furious row in the village of Fuentel Espino de Moya, where we had stopped for lunch. It had started with a joke about an old girlfriend and had grown into a suspicion in Chloe's mind that I was still in love with her. Nothing could have been further from the truth, yet I had taken such suspicion to be a projection of Chloe's own declining feelings for me and accused her of as much. By the time the arguing, sulking, and reconciliations were over, it was mid-afternoon and we were both left wondering what the tears and shouting had been about. There were other arguments. I remember one near the village of Loza del Obispo about whether or not we were bored with one another. Another near Sotashera that had started after I had accused Chloe of being an incompetent map reader and she countered the charge by accusing me of road fascism. The reasons behind such arguments were never the surface ones. Whatever Chloe's deficiencies with the guide Michelin or my intolerance to driving around in large circles through the Spanish countryside, what was at stake were far deeper anxieties. The strength of the, ac of the accusations we made, their sheer implausibility, showed that we argued not because we hated one another, but because we loved one another too much, or to risk confusing things, because we hated loving one another to the extent we did. Our accusations were loaded with a complicated subtext. I hate you because I love you. It amounted to a fundamental protest. I hate having no choice but to risk loving you like this. The pleasures of depending on someone pale next to the paralyzing fears that such dependence involves. Our occasionally fierce and somewhat inexplicable arguments during our trip through Valencia were nothing but a necessary release of tension that came from realizing that each one had placed all their eggs in the other's basket and was helpless to aim for more sound household management. Our arguments sometimes, <clears throat> our arguments sometimes had an almost theatrical quality to them. A joy and exuberance would manifest itself as we set about destroying the bookshelf smashing the crockery, or slamming doors. It's nice being able to feel I can hate you like this, Chloe once said to me. It reassures me that you can take it, that I can tell you to fuck off and you'll throw something at me, but stay put. We needed to shout at one another partly to see whether or not we could tolerate each other's shouting. 
We wanted to test each other's capacity for survival. Only if we had tried in vain to destroy one another would we know we were safe. It is easiest to accept happiness when it is brought about through things that one can control, that one has achieved after much effort and reason. But the happiness I had reached with Chloe had not come as a result of any personal achievement or effort. It was simply the outcome of having, by a miracle of divine intervention, found a person whose company was more valuable to me than that of anyone else in the world. Such happiness was dangerous precisely because it was so lacking in self-sufficient permanence. Had I, after months of steady labor, produced a scientific formula that had rocked the world of molecular biology, I would have had no qualms about accepting the happiness that ensued from such a discovery. The difficulty of accepting the happiness Chloe represented came from my absence and the casual process leading to it, and hence my lack of control over the happiness-inducing element in my life. It seemed to have been arranged by the gods and was consequently accompanied by all the primitive fear of divine retribution. <coughs> all of man's unhappiness comes from an inability to stay in his room alone, said Pascal, advocating a need for man to build up his own resources over and against a debilitating dependence on the social sphere. But how could this possibly be achieved in love? Proust tells the story of Muhammad II, who, sensing that he was falling in love with one of the wives in his harem, at once had her killed because he did not wish to live in spiritual bondage to another. Short of this, I had long ago given up hopes of achieving self-sufficiency. I had gone out of my room and begun to love another, thereby taking on the risk inseparable from basing one's life around another human being. The anxiety of loving Chloe was in part the anxiety of being in a position where the cause of my happiness might so easily vanish, where she might suddenly lose interest, die, or marry another. At the height of love, there appeared a temptation to end the relationship prematurely so that either Chloe or I could play at being the executioner rather than see the other partner or habit or familiarity end things. We were sometimes seized by an urge, manifested in our arguments about nothing, to kill our love affair before it had reached its natural end, a murder committed not out of hatred, but out of an excess of love, or rather, out of the fear that an excess of love may bring. Lovers may kill their own love story only because they are unable to tolerate the uncertainty, the sheer risk that their experiment in happiness has delivered. Hanging over every love story is the thought, as horrible as it is unknowable, of how it will end. It is as when, in full health and vigor, we try to imagine our own death, the only difference between the end of love and the end of life being that at least in the latter we are granted the comforting thought that we will not feel anything after death. No such comfort for the lover who knows that the end of the relationship will not necessarily be the end of love and almost certainly not the end of life. <clears throat> Contractions. Though questions of reality and falsehood in this area are notorious for resisting scrutiny and systematic analysis, after our return from Spain, I began to suspect, without quite being able to look at the evidence in the face, that Chloe had started to simu simulate all or some of her orgasms. Her customary behavior was replaced by an exaggerated activity apparently designed to divert me from her lack of genuine involvement in the process. The change was not accompanied by any obvious sign of uninterest. Indeed, lovemaking as a whole became more passionate. Not only was it performed more often, it was also performed in different positions and at different hours of the day. It was more turbulent. There were screams, even crying, the gestures closer to anger than the gentleness normally associated with the act. What should have been said to Chloe was eventually shared with a great male friend instead. I don't know what's happening, Will. Sex simply isn't what it used to be. Don't worry, it goes in phases. You can't expect it to be high octane every time. Not even I expect that. I just feel something else is wrong. I don't know what, but in the months since we came back from Spain, 
I've been noticing stuff. And I don't mean only in the bedroom. That's just kind of a symptom. I mean everywhere. Like? Well, nothing I could put a finger on directly. All right, here's one thing I remember. She likes a different cereal than me, but because I spend a lot of time at her place, she usually buys the kind of cereal I like so we can have breakfast together. Then all of a sudden last week, she stops buying it and says it's too expensive. I don't want to come to any conclusions. I'm just noticing. Will and I were standing in the reception area of our office. A cocktail party was in progress to celebrate the firm's 20th birthday. I had brought Chloe with me, for whom this was a first chance to see my workspace. Why does Will have so many more commissions than you? Chloe asked Will and me after wandering around the exhibit. You answer that one, Will. That's because real geniuses always have a hard time getting their work accepted, answered Will, cancelling out what might have been a compliment through exaggeration. Your designs are brilliant, Chloe told him. I've never seen anything so inventive, especially for office projects. The use of materials is just incredible, and the way you've managed to integrate the brick and metal so well. Couldn't you do things like that? Chloe asked me. I'm working on a number of ideas, but my style is very different. I work with different materials. Well, I think Will's work is just great. Incredible, in fact. I'm so glad I came to see it. Chloe, it's great to hear you say so, answered Will. I'm so impressed. Your work is exactly the kind of thing I'm interested in, and I think it's such a pity that more architects don't do what you're trying to do. I imagine it can't be easy. It's not that easy, but I've always been taught to go with the things I believe in. I build the houses that make me feel real, and then the people who live in them end up absorbing a kind of energy from them. I think I see what you mean. You'd see better if we were out in California. I was working on a project in Monterey, and I mean, there you'd really get a sense of what you can do by using different kinds of stone, as well as some steel and aluminum, and working with the landscape instead of against it. It is part of good manners not to question the criteria responsible for eliciting another's love. The dream is that one has not been loved for criteria at all, but rather for who one is, an ontological status beyond properties or attributes. From within love, as within wealth, a taboo surrounds the means of acquiring and sustaining affection or property. Only poverty, either of love or money, leads one to question the system, perhaps the reason why lovers do not make great revolutionaries. Passing an unfortunate woman in the street one day, Chloe had asked me, would you have loved me if I'd had an enormous birthmark on my face like she does? The yearning is that the answer be yes, an answer that would place love above the mundane surfaces of, of the body, or more particularly, its cruel, unchangeable ones. I will love you not just for your wit and talent and beauty, but simply because you are you, with no strings attached. I love you for who you are deep in your soul, not for the color of your eyes or the length of your legs or the size of your checkbook. checkbook. The longing is that the love, lover admire us stripped of our external assets, appreciating the essence of our being without accomplishments, ready to repeat the unconditional love said to exist in some parts between parent and child. The real self is what one can freely choose to be, and if a birthmark arises on our forehead or age withers us or recession bankrupts us, then we must be excused for accidents that have damaged what is only our surface. And even if we are beautiful and rich, then we do not wish to be loved on account of these things, for they may fail us, and with them, love. I would prefer you to compliment me on my brain than on my face, but if you must, then I would rather you comment on my smile, motor and muscle control, than on my nose, static and tissue-based. The desire is that I be loved even if I lose everything, leaving nothing but me, this mysterious me taken to be the self at its weakest, most vulnerable point. Do you love me enough that I may be weak with you? Everyone loves strength, but do you love me for my weakness? That is the real test. Do you love me stripped of everything that might be lost for only the things I will have forever? That evening at the architectural office, I first began to sense Chloe slipping away from me, losing admiration for my work, and beginning to question my value in relation to other men. Because I was tired, and Chloe and Will were not, I went home, and they chose to go on the West End for a drink. 
Chloe told me she'd call as soon as she got home, but by 11 o'clock, I decided to call her. The answer phone replied, as it did when I called again at 2.30 that morning. The urge was to confess my anxieties into the machine, but to formulate them seemed to bring them closer into existence, dragging a suspicion into the realm of accusation and counter-accusation. Perhaps it was nothing, or at, the, or at least everything. I preferred to imagine her in an accident than playing truant with Will. I called the police at four in the morning and asked them in the most responsible tone a man drunk on vodka may adopt if they had not seen evidence, perhaps a mutilated body or wrecked Volkswagen, of my angel in a short green skirt and black jacket, last seen in an office near the Barbican. No, sir, no such sightings had been made. Was she a relative or just a friend? Could I wait till morning and contact the station again then? One can think problems into existence, Chloe had told me. I dared not think, for fear of what I might find. The freedom to think involves the courage to stumble upon our demons, but the frightened mind cannot wonder. I stayed tethered to my paranoia, brittle as glass. Bishop Berkeley and later Chloe had said, that if one shuts one's eyes, the outer world may be said to be no more real than a dream. And now more than ever, the power of illusion came to seem comforting. The urge not to look truth in the face, the urge that if only one did not think, an unpleasant truth might not exist. Feeling implicated in her absence, guilty for my suspicions, and angry at my own guilt, I pretended to have noticed nothing when Chloe and I met at 10 o'clock the following day. Yet she must have been guilty, for I, why else would she have gone to her local supermarket to add to her kitchen the missing breakfast cereal to fill wet Welchmert's stomach? She accused herself not by her indifference, but by her sense of duty, a large packet of three cereal golden brown pr prominently placed on the window ledge. Is something wrong with it? Isn't that the one you like? asked Chloe, watching me stumble over my mouthfuls. She said she had stayed the night at her girlfriend Paula's house. Will and she had chatted till late in a bar in Soho, and now she had had a bit to drink. It had seemed easier to stop off in Bloomsbury than make the journey back home to Islington. She had wanted to call me, but it would surely have woken me up. I had said I wanted to go to sleep early, so wasn't it the best thing? Why was I making that face? Did I want more milk to go with the three cereals? An urge accompanies epistemically centered accounts of reality. The urge, if they are pleasant, to believe them. Like an optimistic simpleton's view of the world, Chloe's version of her evening was desirably believable, like a hot bath in which I wish to sit forever. If she believes in it, why shouldn't I? If it's this simple for her, why should it be so complicated for me? I wish to be taken in by her story of a night spent on the floor of Paula's flat in Bloomsbury, able in that case to set aside my alternative evening, another bed, another man, unfaked pleasure. Like the voter from whom the politician's caramel promise draws a tear, I was lured by falsehood's ability to appeal to my deepest emotional yearning. Therefore, as she had spent the night with Paula, had bought cereal, and all was forgiven, I felt a burst of confidence and relief, like a man awakening from a nightmare. I got up from the table and put my arms around the beloved's thick white pullover, caressing her shoulders through the wool, then bending down to kiss her neck, nibbling at her ear, feeling the familiar perfume of her skin and the brush of her hair against my face. Don't, not now, said the angel. But disbelieving, caught up in the familiar perfume of her skin and brush of her hair against his face, Cupid continued to pucker his lips against her flesh. I said once already, not now, repeated the angel, so that even he might hear. The pattern of the kiss had been formed during their first night together. She had placed her head beside his, and fascinated by the soft juncture between mind and body, he had begun running his lips along the curve of her neck. It had made her shudder and smile. She had played with his hand and shut her eyes. It had become a routine between them, a signature of their intimate language. Don't, not now. Hate is the hidden script in the letter of love. Its foundations are shared with its opposite. The woman seduced by her partner's way of kissing her neck, turning the pages of a book, 
or telling a joke watches irritation collect at precisely these points. It is as if the end of love was already contained in its beginning, the ingredients of love's collapse eerily foreshadowed by those of its creation. I said once already, not now. There are cases of skilled doctors, experts at detecting the first signs of cancer in their patients, who will somehow ignore the growth of football-sized tumors in their own body. There are examples of people who in most walks of life are clear and rational, but who are unable to accept that one of their children has died or that their wife or husband has left them and will continue to believe the child has merely gone missing or the spouse will leave their new marriage for the old. The shipwrecked lover cannot accept the evidence of the wreckage, continuing to behave as though nothing had changed in the vain hope that by ignoring the verdict of execution, death will somehow be stalled. The signs of death were everywhere waiting to be read, had I not been struck by the illiteracy pain had induced. The victim of love's demise grows unable to locate original strategies to revive the corpse. At precisely the time when things might still have been rescued with ingenuity, fearful, and hence unoriginal, I became nostalgic. Sensing Chloe drawing away, I attempted to pull her back through blind repetition of elements that had in the past cemented us. I continued with the kiss, and in the weeks thereafter, insisted that we return to cinemas and restaurants where we had spent pleasant evenings. I revisited jokes we had laughed at together. I readopted positions our bodies had once molded. I sought comfort in the familiarity of our in-house language, the language used to ease previous conflicts, a joke designed to acknowledge and hence render inoffensive the temporary fluctuations of love. Is something wrong today? I asked one morning when Venus looked almost as pale and sad as I. Today? Yes, today. Is something wrong? No. Why? Is there any reason it should be? I don't think so. So why are you asking? I don't know, because you're looking a bit unhappy. Sorry for being human. I'm just trying to help. Out of ten today, what would you give me? I really don't know. Why not? I'm tired. Just tell me. I can't. Come on. Out of ten. Six, three, minus twelve, plus twenty? I don't know. Have a guess. For Christ's sake, I don't know. Leave me alone, damn it. The in-house language unraveled. <clears throat> it grew unfamiliar to Chloe, or rather, she feigned forgetting so as not to admit denial. She refused complicity in the language. She played the foreigner. She began reading me against the grain and found errors. I could not understand why things I was saying, and in that the past had proved so attractive I could not understand why things I was saying and that in the past had proved so attractive were now suddenly so irritating. I could not understand why, having not changed myself, I should now be accused of being offensive in a hundred different ways. Panicking, I embarked on an attempt to return to the golden age, asking myself, what had I been doing then that I perhaps am not doing now? I became a desperate conformist to a past self that had been the object of love. What I had failed to realize was that, the pa was that the past self was the one now proving so annoying and that I was therefore doing nothing but accelerating the process towards disillusion. I became an irritant, one who has gone beyond caring for reciprocation. I bought her books, I took her jackets to the dry cleaners, I paid for dinner, I suggested we make a trip at Paris at Christmas, time to celebrate our anniversary, but humiliation could be only the result of loving against all evidence. She could sulk me, shout at me, ignore me, tease me, trick me, hit me, kick me, and still I would not react, and thereby grew abhorrent. At the end of a meal, I had spent two hours preparing, largely taken up by an odd argument we fell into over Balkan history after Chloe began a peculiar defense of Serbian nationalism. I took Chloe's hand and told her, I just wanted to say, and I know it sounds sentimental, that however much we fight and everything, I still really care about you and want things to work between us. You mean everything to me, you know that. Chloe, who had always read more psychoanalysis than fiction, looked at me suspiciously and replied, 
Listen, it's kind of <clears throat> you to say so, but it worries me. You've got to stop turning me into your ego ideal like this. Things had reduced themselves to a tragicomic scenario. On the one hand, the man identifying the woman as an angel. On the other, the angel identifying love as something only a little short of a pathology. So there's about 50 or so pages left. And that's going to be in part three. I hope you enjoyed that. Pardon the delay. I hope you have a good sleep, though. Good night. Bye.